Well, hello, and welcome to our live stream at Grace. My name is Kingsley. I'm one of the pastoral interns here at the church. If you're visiting for the first time, special welcome to you, or maybe you're a returning viewer. Thank you for inviting us into your journey of faith. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 100, and it serves as a great counterbalance uh, for our hearts today as we come to worship. A counterbalance, I say, because in this week, you might be coming with feelings of frustration or fatigue, uncertainty, anxiety, maybe skepticism or disappointment over things happening in your life in the world around. Whatever it may be, God doesn't want you to dismiss that or tuck that under the rug. No, he wants you to bring that with you to church, and he wants you to come as you are. And so coming as you are and then seeing him as he is, he wants to help counterbalance some of those emotions that we feel, so that in sorrow we might have joy, in frustration we might have peace. And so as we read today, uh, this is God's invitation to you to come as you are. Where it says leader, I will read, and where it says all, I invite you to read. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. If you're able to, I invite you to please stand as we sing these songs of worship to God. Here, Lord Jesus. You 
darkness you were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt We now come to our prayer of confession. The prayer of confession can be uncomfortable for many. And the reason why is oftentimes we come with thoughts like, will God really forgive me? Will God really be gracious to me? These thoughts aren't unnatural given the world that we live in. The, the world can be unforgiving, relentlessly unforgiving. We, we see it in the amount of blame shifting that happens in our workspaces. We see it in the excuses that our family members make. Uh, we see it when, when, when our friends are throwing each other under the bus because they want to hide their failures. It's hard not to take this relationship that we have with one another and, and, and not to bring that to God. Yet the Bible reminds us that God is not like us. When we come to God as we are, God remains who he is. He remains a gracious father, a loving savior, a kind redeemer. So God says to us, you might live in a heartless world, but with me, you have a haven in this heartless world, a safe haven. 
And so today, as we come to, to pray this prayer of confession, I invite you to come as you are and to receive his grace as you confess humbly. Where it says all, I invite you to read. Where it says leader, I will read. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Lord, have mercy and forgive us through Christ. Amen. Amen. Please take a moment to silently and privately confess your sins. Father, we thank you for being who you are, constant in forgiveness, abounding in grace, patient beyond measure. We thank you for Jesus, your son, who paid the penalty of our sin and freed us from living a life of fear. We thank you for who you are and all that you've done in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, for those of us who have confessed our sins, I want you to hear these words of assurance. These words of assurance come from 1 John chapter 1, verse 4 to 7. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. And this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Please rise as we sing the song of assurance. Jacob, oh God, let us be a 
generation that seeks, that seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. Now we pray for the congregation and the community to help us in that. We have John. Please join me as we pray for the church and city. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to your creation, to your church, and to us, your children. Thank you for loving us through our weaknesses and sins, and thank you for sending us your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we could know that love and live in the promises of your kingdom. But today we wait, Lord. Today we plead for your peace and order, for restoration for this world. So much seems broken and failing. As Paul writes, the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. We pray for our church and city to be safe from COVID. We pray for frontline workers to be safe, for our leaders to make wise decisions concerning health policy. And we thank you for recent trends that show that the spread of the virus is slowing. We pray for the sick, that you would heal them. We pray for the dead, that they would be with you and that you would comfort their loved ones. There isn't one person whose life hasn't been affected by this, so we pray for everyone, that your spirit would minister to them in the specific and personal way they need to endure and experience your love. We pray also for those fighting for racial equality and justice, especially those here in our city and in our church. We pray that their message, your message, would be heard, Lord, especially by leaders in positions to reshape public policy. We pray that we would be convicted of our own racial biases and blind spots and repent. We pray that we would be convicted to take action against systemic racism and injustice, which disproportionately affects the lives of our black and indigenous brothers and sisters. We pray that your will would be done in this area. We pray for the patience and strength to help see your kingdom to come. Thank you for the good work that you've started in us, Lord, and the promise to see it through and perfect it until the day of Christ. Give us patience for the wait and strength for the work of ushering in the kingdom. Degree by degree and day by day, you are bringing us closer to you. Help us to get there, we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. We now come to our time of tithes and offering, and to the right of your screen, you'll see some instructions on how you can give at Grace. Giving is one of the many practical ways Christians are able to, to be a good steward of God's gifts to us, and it's also a way for us to enter into the ministry work that God is doing in the church and in the city. If you're investigating the Christian faith, please feel no pressure to give. We are grateful and glad that you're inviting us into your journey of faith. At this point, I'd like to transition us to our next segment and section of our service, and that is the, the reading of God's word and the teaching of God's word. We are nearing the end of our series in the Sermon on the Mount, and today we will be considering a, a text that has some life-changing, spirit-renewing, heart-liberating truths which are meant to satisfy our souls forever. And so as we hear God's word read to us, and as we hear it taught to us, please listen carefully, lean in, as God reveals himself to us today. To help us with the reading of God's word, we have Pamela. Our reading today is from Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. My name is Tar George, and I'm the Director of Family Discipleship here at Grace Toronto Church. And today I have the tremendous privilege of exploring with you this great passage from Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11. 
Over the last several weeks, we've been looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and learning from him more and more about what it means to follow him, specifically how we are called to live and what we are called to desire in this present time. And here's why. Because what we seek says something about who we are. In the last few months, as the pandemic has continued, Toronto has recorded internet usage increasing by more than 40% for consumers. We're working from home, taking Zoom calls, and having to do mostly everything business-related and personal online at the moment. We use online tools to stay up to date on our news, to find work, to seek out a partner, to school our kids, to entertain ourselves, to bank, to buy food, to shop. The list goes on. See, the internet has been quickly becoming for some time now the normative way that we human beings seek and search for anything through a click of a button. In fact, our internet browsers are filled with piles and piles of data on the many things we seek and search for regularly, if we dare look. I did that fairly recently. I wanted to know what is it that I seek in my personal time? What would my search history show about me? Well, I found myself spending a ton of time in news and social media to make sense of the events of the last few weeks. I then found myself spending an exorbitant amount of time on Netflix and YouTube to distract myself from the discouragement and helplessness that I felt. I noticed that I checked my bank account and investments almost obsessively. I was on work emails when I should have been spending time with my wife. I saw to my surprise that I shop more online than I usually ever did in person. I saw the many tabs from Realtor.ca as I worried if I might be able to afford a permanent home in the city. I repeatedly looked up phrases like a second wave serve and flattening the curve. I even browsed the Toronto Humane Society because I thought that having a pet at a time like this might just cheer me up. You see, while I always thought of myself as being pretty level-headed, the evidence of what I had been seeking told a very different story. My search history showed me to be anxious, distracted, lonely, fatigued, and kind of reckless right now. What I had been seeking said a whole lot about who I've been in this past season. And what about you? And maybe you found yourself doing the same sorts of things lately. I wonder, what are the things that you might be turning to? What would your search history show about you, your social involvements, your pastimes, your spending habits? Have these things been wide and deep enough to satisfy you? See, I think there's just something inherently about us that makes us want to seek for things, isn't there? Even good things. We turn to these things looking for a sense of identity, of comfort, of control. And COVID-19, I think more than any other period in our lives, has revealed and exposed that to us. But this passage in front of us today invites us to confront these things. It begs to ask the question, could there be a better way to seek for what we need? See, Jesus in our passage today has a timely invitation for us to seek. Here, Jesus wants to ask and answer two questions for us. First, where should we seek? And second, how should we seek? Where should we seek? And how should we seek? Where should we seek? Jesus here teaches that we ought to have a posture of asking, seeking, and knocking. In just one line, he makes two fundamental claims about us. First, that all of us have needs. It doesn't matter if you're religious or irreligious, we're all trying to seek for things that will either fix or further ourselves in the pursuit of happiness and our life goals. As one character from the movie The Matrix says, to deny our own impulses, our needs, is to deny the very thing that makes us human. Jesus knows this. He claims that our most basic instinct is to long for what we need and to pursue it. His second claim is this, that our most pressing needs often can't be realized alone. No matter how capable we think we are, we often don't have enough resources in and of ourselves to help change our circumstances. Asking, seeking, and knocking implies that there is help that we need from someone or something else for our flourishing. But it's more personal than that, isn't it? When you need directions, you ask someone for help. When you knock on a door, you are hoping that there's someone on the other side who will open and welcome you in. The language of asking, seeking, and knocking sounds to me a lot like the language of relationship. Which means this, that perhaps what you and I are really seeking and needing is perhaps not a thing or a set of things at all, but a person. See, earlier in Matthew 6, Jesus talks about not being anxious about your life, your food, your clothes. He says that the Gentiles, these people who don't know God, seek after all these things, and we're not to do the same. But these people hyper-seek. The Greek word he uses there is epizetio. They seek in a way that's not actually healthy. It's obsessive. It's all-consuming. Accumulating temporary things and experiences is their highest priority. We're not to be like that. 
Now, Jesus knows that these things are not unimportant either. And if you recall, he's quick to say that God knows that you need them. They're important. But then he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Jesus is not saying that we ought not to want or need earthly possessions and experiences, but they are not to be our highest priority. They are not to be the things that we hyper-seek. We are certainly encouraged to ask for these things, but within the context of this passage today, we are encouraged to ask, seek, and knock to obtain something much more than that. Relationship with God himself. Jesus is making an astounding claim. What Jesus is saying is that all of life's needs really boil down to one primary need. The search for all things is ultimately about searching the one thing, to know God and to live all of life by his grace. Now, if you're here and you're exploring the Christian faith, you might find that hard to stomach, and I grant you that. But ask yourself this, do I feel satisfied with the things that I've been seeking? Have they been enough? Could it be that I was made for something grander? In his 1943 paper, A Theory of Human Motivation, renowned psychologist Abraham Maslow put forward a set of needs that he believed govern human motivation. It was a huge breakthrough in understanding the human psyche, and it's still studied actually even today. And what Maslow did was to categorize the whole scope of human needs, ranking them in order of importance. This was later illustrated in a pyramid called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Maybe you've seen it or heard of it somewhere. And what Maslow said was this, that there are certain base human needs that have to be met before a person can strive for a greater set of needs. There is an order. Basic needs come first, things like food, water, rest, safety. Then psychology, uh, psychological needs, things like love, friendship, a need to belong, a need to feel accomplished. And at the very top, he placed what he called self-actualization, the need to achieve one's full potential and be all that he or she can be. And what Maslow claimed was this, that if one could work their way up the chain of needs, if they could climb the pyramid, so to speak, they will arrive at the very peak of human potential. They would be thoroughly satisfied. It was exciting stuff. And what I love about this paper is that Maslow and many other psychologists studying this show that really we are people of body and soul. Our needs are quite different from any other species on the planet. We are neither primitive nor animalistic. We have a real heightened desire to seek. But here's what researchers began to find. Seeking for an increase in prestige and accomplishment often hurt one's seeking of love and friendship. The search for self-actualization, arguably the greatest human need, often made people trample many others to get there. And most explicitly, being at the very peak of Maslow's hierarchy of needs was for many people extremely lonely. See, studies quickly found that arriving at the top and accumulating the very best of human possessions and experiences was somehow just not enough. Ironically, self-actualization actually led to self-loathing. And that should tell us something. See, I think Maslow was right about many of his assumptions, but his secular worldview just didn't allow for another layer in his pyramid. Maslow argued this, that what is necessary to change or evolve a person is to change his awareness of himself. I think that's spot on. Except what Maslow and much of our culture haven't realized or missed is that you don't arrive at full awareness of yourself by looking at the things around you. No other person and no other thing in the universe has the capacity to tell you who you really are except your maker, God. See, to truly self-actualize and have full awareness of yourself, you must be aware of who you belong to and who you were created for. If you subscribe wholeheartedly to Maslow's secular pyramid, you have nowhere to go with your longings. You have nowhere to turn to at the very top, but to yourself. I don't know about you, but I disappoint myself often. I need somewhere better to turn, and even the most secular of scholars seem to think that you do too. See, to have a right view of ourselves, we must have a right view of God, because it is Him who we need most. And conversely, knowing God actually frees you to self-actualize. Knowing God frees you to be more you than you've ever had the capacity or potential to be by your own making because it frees you to be and become as God made you. And I think this is why Jesus drives us to come to God. He knows we need something better. All throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been teaching radical things about sexual ethics, social standing, money, relationships, possessions. The, these are the pressure points of our culture. These are the places that we're tempted to go with our longings, but they are false gods. 
Jesus' teachings here highlight that we often seek our identity, our comfort, our security, our control from these things rather than from God. And as we've been seeing, nothing on earth can grant you these things in the way that we most need, in the way that we most want. Acclaimed writer C.S. Lewis says this, he writes, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. See, he gets this. Where should we seek for our needs? Not from lesser things. There is only one place, and that is from God. How should we seek? Boldly and with confidence. In the second part, Jesus talks to us and tells us how we ought to seek. Jesus here teaches that we ought to come to God asking, seeking, and knocking. He uses three verbs in verses 7 to 8 to show something of the intensity and the continual nature of how we ought to pray and seek God. We are to seek boldly and with confidence. These words, ask, seek, and knock, here are in the Greek imperative, which means that Jesus is not just giving us good advice. He's giving us a command, do this. If you recognize your needs, don't be embarrassed. Don't be tactful. Just say it. Ask. Be shameless. Children do this, don't they? I learned this at an early age when my family would go visit my grandparents. They had a massive bungalow with many, many rooms, and being only five years old at the time, it was sometimes difficult for me to find the adults that I was looking for. And so I would do the very best thing I knew how. I would go into the center of the house, into this large living room, and I would yell at the top of my lungs, Mama! Mama! No answer. So I would do that a couple more times. When that didn't work, I would begin roaming through the house seeking her whereabouts. It would usually take about five to ten minutes, but I would usually arrive at the same place each time. The light under the door in the bathroom would always tell me exactly where she was. And then I would knock. And like the dutiful, exasperated parent, she would yell back, I'm in the bathroom, Tarek. What is it now? I don't know what it is about the bathroom, but kids just seem to know intuitively that this, this is the time to go bother mommy. Well, it became a regular rhythm during the holidays to play this game, ask, seek, and knock. Sometimes I would need permission for something. Other times I needed her help. And still other times I had something that I was just so excited to show her. Whatever it was, it just couldn't wait. Now imagine a God who actually longs for us to come like that, to disturb him at any time, to disturb him boldly. This is what Jesus is teaching and is found in no other belief system. God is not aloof, he's not busy, and he never grows tired of hearing from us. His greatest delight is when his children need him and want him. And we do have needs. Have you ever found that the times when you are most needy are also seem to be the times when you are most bold? I find of myself that I tend to ask and seek God with a different kind of urgency when I'm hungry for something as opposed to when I'm well fed. Neediness drives us, and God knows that. Jesus says here that asking, seeking after God should be our first priority, yet too often it's our last resort, isn't it? We either try to do everything on our own and then ask God to bless it, or something goes terribly, horribly wrong and we have to ask God to fix it. This is me often, and I'm not alone. A recent Pew study found that even among secular people, one in four people pray when a personal crisis or tragedy affects them. The study was actually published before COVID-19, but even conservative estimates say that this number has only increased. It sounds to me that for most people, however they may identify, whether religious or not, people are driven by a neediness, a neediness to seek and ask and obtain God. And Jesus here invites us to consider our neediness, not just in crisis, but in all of life, and to ask boldly, what do you want right now? What are you needing from God? Ask him boldly. Ask him shamelessly. How should you seek? Seek boldly. But Jesus also tells us here to seek with confidence. Because you can seek something boldly, as boldly as you want, but if you have no confidence in the one that you go to, your bravado will not carry you anywhere. And so in verses 8, Jesus tells us that we can be confident. We will receive. We will find. It will be open to us. Why? Because in verses 9 to 11, Jesus tells us who we can have confidence in. Jesus builds on this previous argument and says, Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks him for a fish, will give him a serpent? Parents among you, would you do this to your kids? 
Would you listen to your kids asking for something they want or need and instead give them something useless or harmful? You would not. Jesus says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts and things to those who ask him? Now, I recognize that not everyone here may have had a good relationship with their parents, with their father. And because of that, you may have a really difficult time thinking of God in this way. But here's the important point. Whether your dad was an exemplary parent or he really messed up as a father, compared to God, both examples are utterly pale and appear even evil in contrast to the kind of father that God is. God is not only a better father than we can even comprehend, he is also more attentive, more discerning, and more generous. He's attentive. Jesus says that God hears the requests of his children better than a human father would. He's already stated in Matthew 6 that your heavenly father knows what you need, and yet being all-knowing, your heavenly father still wants to hear the voice of his children. When you give someone a gift, are you not attentive to what that person loves or enjoys? Of course you are. You listen intently to what excites them. You learn more about their needs and wants. And when you finally give that gift, you love seeing the expression on that person's face. Why? because it confirms to you that they received the very thing that you knew they wanted, and it confirms to them that you actually listened. You see, it's not really about the gift, is it? Your generosity is meant to signal something more, that you heard them, that you know them, and you remembered them in the most intimate way possible. So it is with your Father in heaven. He doesn't just give gifts thoughtlessly. He wants you to ask so that he can prove his listening love to you. He's that kind of a father. He is discerning also. He gives good things, but not all and not everything, because he knows what is good for us. Let me tell you, I've met people all my life who've received everything they ever asked for from their fathers, and it did them no good. They developed a purely transactional relationship with their parents, and they grew to actually resent them for it. Gifts became cheap and disconnected from love. You don't want that kind of a father. See, God is not a materialistic father, but neither does he withhold good. He is discerning. Bread and fish here in our passage are a very basic diet in the ancient world. This is not a lot to ask for. If a human father can provide at least that, then surely your heavenly father can do more. Now, you may not receive the exact thing you asked for, but you will certainly not receive something useless like a stone or something harmful like a serpent. God's not like that. He's not cruel. God knows exactly what you need. I think there have been several times in my life when the thing that I was asking for wouldn't have been God's best for me. Only gentle hindsight showed me that. I can also think of several times in my life when God has given me things that I didn't even have the sense to ask for because he knew I needed them. He was both attentive, but more than that, he was discerning. God knows what is best for his kids. Finally, God is generous. Our Father is generous. Jesus says that he provides much more than a human father ever could. Notice that Jesus doesn't specify what things God will give, but only that they are much more excellent than what is being asked. And here's the point. The Bible describes God to be more amazing, more beautiful, and more satisfying than anything you and I could ever conceive of. Heaven with all its perfection and all its treasure would be worthless and disappointing if God were not there. He is that worthy. Now, you can call someone a narcissist if they think they're at the center of everything, but you would be right to do so. But if everything in the world actually revolves around God, and if He is truly the greatest good that can be attained, then we neglect Him at our own peril. In fact, if God is really who He says He is, it may just be narcissistic to reject Him and go your own way. Here's the point Jesus is making. If God is really the epitome of good and he desires to give the very best of things, then for God to give you anything less than himself would be wrong. He would not be a good father. He would either be unloving or he would be less than he claims to be, and God is not like that. And the disciples, hearing the words of Jesus and wanting to know this fatherly God, ask him, Lord, show us the Father. Show us the Father. And Jesus replies to them, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. 
See, these men who followed Jesus acknowledged that they were seeking after God. What they didn't understand was that in Jesus, God came seeking after them. And he came to seek you too. See, through Jesus, God was about to give himself to all people in the most generous but heartbreaking way. Twenty chapters from our passage, Jesus will allow himself to be humiliated, beaten, bloodied, and hung on a Roman cross. And at the cross, Jesus will take upon himself all our sin, all the things that have alienated us from our Heavenly Father, and he will make a way for us to know God in this kind of way and to be adopted into his family. You see, Jesus came from the Father in heaven as the most precious gift that God could provide. We thought we needed material things, but God knew we needed something more. Jesus says rhetorically, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Men and women, this is the very definitive statement that God is good, that when you cried out for bread, God replied, take an eighth. This is my body broken for you. Do you realize how astounding it is that God should do that? If you ever doubt God's goodness or his fatherly love, you need only look to the cross. And then disciple John, wrestling with this great mystery, writes, See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. We have a generous God who longs to be known as your Father. This is the hope that the Christian has, and it is a tremendous hope. This is the very ground on which we can seek God with boldness and confidence. Would you do that? Would you do that today? What can we say in terms of application as we read this? Two things. Seek after God and seek more fully. Seek after God. It's important to say here that to be a child of God is a special privilege. There is a general way in which all people belong to God as a creator and a more specific way here that only some people will accept him as a father. In John chapter 1, verse 12, uh, John writes, but to all who did receive him, Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus even says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want to know God as your Father, if you're tired of seeking things that disappoint you, can I invite you to come to Jesus? The source of all good things. He's that good. You cannot know the fatherly love of God or be part of his family without knowing Jesus Christ. Without him, you have only a hope that what you long for might be heard. With him, you have every assurance and confidence that he's listening because his spirit makes you his child. Second, seek more fully. All of us, whether Christian or not, do at some level hold a distorted view of God. In Genesis 1, God made the world good and placed human beings at the center of it in a garden. The Father in heaven gave people every imaginable gift and bounty, more bread, more fish, and more good than we could ever have desired. And yet, seeing all the good within our grasp, we instead reached out for a serpent. Do you see the strange irony of this passage? See, in Adam and Eve, we believe the lie that God is not a good father, and it's stuck with us ever since. Our sinful condition has deeply affected the way we see God. Sometimes we think he's reluctant to listen or begrudging to give or that we're unworthy to come before him. Hear this, none of those are true because of Jesus. Christ has crushed the serpent, the enemy of your soul. Others of us may feel like we ask God for good, but our situations seem to have only worsened. Let me say that unanswered prayer is difficult. It can be very painful when we don't receive the things for that we ask for in prayer that seem surely good. And the Father knows that. He doesn't ask you to get over it. He knows it's difficult. God knows that it's hard for you. But this passage assures us that his heart is good. And he's not a mean father, that he loves you. He loves us very much. And yet still at the same time, there's this tension here that this text doesn't command us to just be passive and accept the way things are. This text invites us to seek, to even to beat down God's door for help, knowing that we can bring our greatest desires and our deepest disappointments. He's not a fair-weathered father. We can bring both to him. God is delighted when people express their need for him. See, our ability to ask anything of God is actually an assurance that we belong to him. When we ask things from God, we are proclaiming in the loudest possible way, you are my father. In fact, a large aspect of his good gifts is to enable us to live the kind of way that Jesus has been describing in the Sermon on the Mount. There are tremendous resources here for your flourishing. They are here for you. 
that God wants to hear from you means that you are not just another cog in the machinery of the universe. You are deeply known. You are known to him like a child. And the very best gift that he can give you, more secure than money or anything money can buy, is his very presence. I remember when I was about five years old, and my mother, brother, and I were going to spend Christmas in another part of uh, India with our grandparents. I was sad to learn that my father wouldn't be joining us that year because he had several work commitments and he couldn't get time away. And yet being a loving, listening parent, he endeavored to send me the Christmas gift that I'd asked for and that he knew I wanted. It was an Optimus Prime Transformer. It was the best thing ever. And on Christmas morning, I opened my gift excitedly and was instantly riveted with what my parents had bought me. My father heard me and got me the very thing that he knew I wanted. And yet, curiously, as the morning wandered down, I found myself growing less and less enthralled with Optimus Prime. <laughs> there was nothing wrong with it, you see. It was a great gift, but I realized that what I wanted most was to enjoy it with my father. I had what I asked for, but by itself, it just wasn't enough. I remember clearly that afternoon at around 1 p.m., I heard the doorbell, and I distinctly remember hearing my father's voice. I tell you, I cast that toy aside so fast, and I ran down the hall to embrace my father. It was a beautiful time. See, the gift of his coming to be with me cost him something, but it said immeasurably more about his love for me than the little toy I so desired. It was the best Christmas I can recall. Why do I tell that story? You see, I think that God knows that all the things we can amass in this life will never fully satisfy us in the way that He can. All the things we seek for in this life will do us no good if we have them all without our Heavenly Father. And that's precisely why He came. See, my Father knew that even the best, most extravagant gift His little boy could ever conceive of would fall hopelessly short if not accompanied by His presence. And the good news today is that you and I have an even better Father in Heaven and he longs to know you. He came for you. And so this coming week, let me encourage you to seek God, not as some impersonal force, but as your good Father. Seek him boldly, and seek him with confidence. Amen. Amen. And thank you for that reminder of who we are in Christ and who God is for us and to us. Our reflective reading today is a summary of all that we have heard taken from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, where it says, leader, I will read, and where it says, all, I invite you to read. Together now. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us. Thanks be to God. Please join as we sing the song of reflection. Gladly would I leave behind me all the pleasure I have known to pursue surpassing treasures at the throne of God the Son. Worthy of unending worship, love and loveliness is He. By His precious death were millions from the jaws of death set free. Gladly would I give to Jesus all affection, everything. For the washing of his mercy makes my ransomed heart to sing. Holy, holy is the chorus rising up from those who see. Christ exalted, bright and burning from the power and purity. Where else can I go? Jesus, you're the one that I was made to know. What else?
else can I do? Jesus, you're my all. I gladly run to you. satisfies earthly treasures all are passing thieves break in and rusty strives but in God our awesome splendor love and everlasting joys where else can I go can I do? Jesus, you're my all. I gladly run to you. Gladly would I give to Jesus all affection, everything, for the washing of his mercy makes my ransomed heart to sing. Well, as we conclude today's service, I want to say thank you for joining us here at Grace. Before you go, we have two quick announcements for you. The first is a class that we're offering on July 8, 15, and 22 at 7.30 p.m., the class is entitled, The Sovereignty of God in Providence and Salvation. And here we will study the rule of God and the role of men and women in the events of history and the salvation of sinners. If you're interested, please click the links in the description below to register. The second announcement that we have is our census. Please fill out the survey before Sunday, July 12th. If you're not on our mailing list yet, please contact us and let us know so that we can hear from you and we can get that survey to you. Now, please rise for the benediction. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Well, Grace, thank you again for joining us here today. I wish you a great day and a happy Sunday. Take care. from heaven you came running there was mercy 